this industry, because it was really never required to in its historical development, more so in the Gulf Coast region or other arid regions of the country, the basic, you know, three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, were never really embraced a lot, um, just simply because they didn't have a need to. In our region of Pennsylvania, um, particularly North Central, that was going to be a driving factor. So we developed what, in our opinion, was a more sustainable, more responsible, beneficial reuse of the generated waters. Um, if you're only getting 10 or 12 percent of the water back, the next well you're going to need to add 85 percent, basically fresh water to that. You know, you got significant dilution associated with chlorides. The big breakthrough also came for us in working with the various service companies, Halliburton, Schlumberger, Fractech, you name it. What do you guys do offshore when you do oil or natural gas well development? What, do you, what water, what resource do you use? Well, of course, they use seawater. So what would you guys need in terms of water quality to reuse um, successfully a second time um, for your uh, development plans? Well, if you can meet the standards for when you blend the two waters back together, basically seawater, um, that's suitable. They have plenty of uh, strategies for well development plans, um, technologies for deploying that. So it was kind of a transfer of offshore practices to onshore practices um, to, to do that. <clears throat> the treatment and disposal options, again, Historically, the legacy practice in PA was basically just to remove heavy metals um, from, the, from the water and then allow the uh, dissolved solids, predominantly the salts, um, to be diluted in the receiving streams. Um, when you look at the waste characterization of this water, um, it's not uncommon to see uh, chlorides pushing 110, 120,000 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids starting to approach 180, 200,000 milligrams per liter. Um, so when you talk about the large volumes, anticipating or expecting the receiving streams to manage that um, themselves, we didn't think that was the best practice. Um, so we pursued our um, recycle, reuse, beneficial reuse um, program. What the energy companies required, or more so their service companies, is they needed at the bare minimum a predictable fluid so that when they received this water on site they knew how it was going to react, how it was going to respond so that as they added their various chemical um, constituents in their, in their frac um, designs that it wouldn't adversely interfere, basic chemistry. You don't want to add a cationic polymer to an anionic fluid you're going to end up with something that's not going to perform as anticipated um, as you start moving those you know, fluids with large pumps and, and so forth. So we worked with a number of groups to you know, demonstrate that um, with the blending ratios and everything else, put them on friction reducing loops, that their existing strategies would work. Um, and then the, the real issue came up is, all right, what about the potential for scale forming constituents that are remaining in the water? Predominantly those metals, you know, if it's barium strontium or other uh, cations, um, calcium is a concern for some operators. Um, iron, manganese, uh, magnesium, all those, you know, um, items. But they're very conventional in terms of their removal criteria. Um, industry has been removing heavy metals, you know, going on uh, many decades at this point in time. So <clears throat> it wasn't an unknown uh, means by which to manage those effectively. And then the question was, is which clients were concerned about the prospect of reintroducing that water into another well development um, will it have the potential to scale down hole, resulting in less gas that can come back up the, you know, the well casing? Um, and are there any long-term uh, effects, you know, in terms of the productiveness of that particular well? 
some clients say, you know, it's not a problem. We're just going to put in um, uh, scaling agents, keep things um, sequestered. It's not going to be an issue. That's one way of approaching it. Um, others choose to remove a certain or have a known quantity before they put it back down hole. They're the folks that we tend to work with. One of the big differences for us <clears throat> is ownership of the water. Like any industrial activity, um, you know, the energy companies are the generators of that flow back and produced water. Um, they need to manage it in a regulatory compliant manner. Um, as a result, they have the responsibility, like any other industry, cradle to grave. Um, you know, make sure that it is managed in a regulatory compliant manner from the time that they're done using it um, until it's, you know, ultimate disposal. Um, I'll come back to that here in a little bit. And same thing for any byproducts that are generated in the processing of this water. Who owns those um, byproducts? Is it the energy companies? Or is it somebody that's out there in the field, maybe working with them to treat this water or process the water in any way? <clears throat> some of the current um, practices, and I just want to bring this up um, to kind of give some uh, background information. You know, again, in order to obtain water uh, throughout the Commonwealth, um, you've got various, you know, regulatory bodies. If you're in the Susquehanna River Basin or the Delaware River Basin, you have the river commissions that have, um, you know, jurisdiction and primacy in, in some of those regards. If you're in Western PA, DEP still has um, responsibility. You still need to obtain approval from the Department of uh, Environmental Protection for withdrawal or use of that, of that resource. Um, again, a lot of folks were just doing permit by rule for existing municipal water um, sources, anybody who had it. Um, the disposal, the existing POTWs in Western PA, the dedicated facilities that um, had been operating in Western PA. And then what a lot of folks were doing is because a lot of this development does occur in uh, difficult to access regions, remote areas um, in, in North Central, Northeastern Pennsylvania, um, is, is where we have, you know, a lot of ridge and valley. So we have a lot of verticals up there. And it can be challenging to get access to some of these sites. Some of the practices that um, uh, the service companies that support the energy um, development was they were taking smaller trucks to the well pad because they're easy to navigate and get into the sites and then transloading onto larger tanker trucks and then sending that to a facility in Western PA or someplace like that. Question was, is, is that regulatory compliant? N no, it's not. That's considered a transfer um, activity of a residual waste. You would have to receive a um, transfer permit in order to practice that um, at any location um, other than a well pad. Um, so the load consolidation that kind of started out, went away quickly um, as people determined, you know, that it is not regulatory compliant. Um, a number of operators began looking at, you know, just basic blending. Again, if you're only getting a small percentage of this water back, can you just blend it with fresh water and have no adverse effects? Some continue to do that. Others do minimal treatment just to remove the suspended solids. Um, from it, um, basic filtration, um, and then others, you know, we're looking at is there a interference that could be created because you don't have compatible chemistries, like I mentioned earlier. Um, if you're withdrawing water from a river that is um, highly impacted by AMD discharges in the region, um, you may find that you can have adverse downhole effects as a result of the sulfate or iron or other items that are contained in those waters um, that, you know, don't support your program. Certainly um, today, you know, the recent trends, you can't almost read an article, whether it's from industry or a regulatory body um, or, or anybody else. Recycle, reuse. That's absolutely where everybody wants this to go. You know, practice the three R's as best as you possibly can. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of people looking at disposal wells. Do you use a depleted gas field 
potentially. Um, people are looking at that currently. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to be treating this water, um, recycle reuse can be supported only for such a uh, limited period of time. As long as you have an uh, active drilling program, you're pretty much going to always be operating in a net water deficit. You only get so much water back, you still always got to blend in fresh water. So you can kind of sustain that for a, a relatively long period of time. However, at the same time as you, know, you continue to develop more wells, that percentage of produced water that's being generated every day a natural gas well produces gas, it produces some volume of produced water. Um, that'll have to be managed for the life of, of that commercial well. So at some point in time, you may no longer be in a net water deficit. Those lines will cross, and now you need a legitimate ultimate disposal alternative. Um, you know, what is that going to be? A facility dedicated to the industry um, that's going to treat it to the new DEP um, you know, water quality standards, which are you know, essentially better than potable water quality um, in order to discharge to a receiving stream. At the same time as you drive um, through technology, the level of treatment such that it can meet those standards, you also end up with a very high quality water. Numerous other industries may find that a valuable resource, whether it's co-located at, say, a large power plant, and they can use that in their um, cooling waters, um, or you know, certainly send it back to the industry that they may um, utilize it at that high quality water. How long will it take until that time um, is necessary? Um, and in that um, interim period of time, what quality of water is necessary to support the industry? Do you have to go to an ultra clean water, um, which was the historical practice in say the Barnett Shale um, in, in Texas, um, the opinion was, well, you need ultra clean water to maximize the development of the formation. Whereas, you know, today it's more about managing the water quality chemistry and they can live with the, um, predominantly the salt that is contained in there. That does not adversely impact them in their well development. There are some um, that do the same thing as we do. Um, they will make claims that developing a well with all generated waters, those wells are more productive. I'm not willing to go that far. There's way too many variables that go into making you know, a well um, more productive than another. What I can say with confidence is it doesn't hurt the well development um, with beneficial uh, recycling and reusing of the water. Um, so what we have is what we designate as a Gen 1 and Gen 2 facility. Gen 1 is a 100% um, recycle reuse, zero liquid discharge. Every gallon of water that we receive is returned to the industry for some form of beneficial use. Um, again, at some point in time um, when you have more water, produced water to deal with and you can beneficially reuse, then you need to go to what we designate a Gen 2 ultimate disposal technology. Um, it will be some type of a thermal processing system um, capable of meeting the uh, discharge standards that the state's established. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on, and, and is probably um, the number one greatest public concern, is the volume of truck traffic and the disturbance that occurs on air. You know, so if you have, in this case, you know, your existing um, highway network um, designated by, you know, the, the Route 1 there, and then you're going to go in, you've got maybe some existing rural road network um, that's part of there, um, and you're going to start a commercial well development program, 